I'm going to talk a little bit about ethics and social media research, um, just to give an overview. And it's really complicated, I guess, is a, a, a reasonable starting point. And there are no sort of single right answers. And you know, just as Leslie was talking about there being sort of people over here and people over here and their attitudes to how social media data can be used and how valuable that research is, there's also this huge spectrum of very, very different views around what are the ethics of social media research. On, on the one hand, you've got people who are typically from more computer programming and big data analytics backgrounds who feel like Twitter, social media data are publicly available and any, you can pretty much do whatever you like with it. And then you've got people right at the other end, um, typically from the kind of backgrounds that we have or I have, which is sort of social science, social research backgrounds, where we think, actually, hang on, how, where's the consent for this? Where's the anonymity? So on and so forth. Um, and actually really, really scared and, and quite off put or put off about using social media data. And again, I think the kind of conclusion that Leslie was coming to is that actually there's this middle ground and we're trying to sort of feel our way to what that is. So what I'm not going to do is give a load of answers about ethics and social media research, but what I'll try and do is raise some questions. And I think that's, for my personal perspective, my personal opinion, that's the best way forward is when you're conducting research, if you're conducting research with social media data, it's thinking about your particular project, your particular circumstances, and your particular data, and what are the particular issues um, related to that, that. So that's sort of the conclusion of what I'm going to talk about, um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail. Um, the first thing that I'd like to mention is, and the reason I'm talking about this, is I lead something called the New Social Media, New Social Science Network, which was originally an NCRM-funded network about four or five years ago. Uh, they funded it for a year, but then since then, um, NATSEN, uh, National Centre for Social Research, is where I work, we have taken it on, and we now sort of internally fund it and manage it as sort of part of our ongoing charitable remit for, for methodological uh, development. And we have a Twitter handle and a hashtag, a blog, and we run various events throughout the year. Um, so if you're interested in social media research, do follow us, do engage with us. It's, it's a really useful network and worthwhile um, following. Um, so why did we end up looking into ethics? So one of the key issues that came out of our network events um, we ran early on when we were first setting up was that regardless what we were talking about, whether we were talking about tools for social media analysis, you know, how actually useful it is, whatever we spoke about, people were always raising concerns about um, ethics um, and more specifically expressing concerns about what they saw as a lack of guidance on how to deal with some of the very, very specific um, ethical issues raised by this sort of new methodological area. Um, and actually, what we did, we surveyed our members and um, we found that sort of only around a third felt that, they, that the current guidelines that they had um, were up to date uh, and adequate for the kind of research that they were trying to do. So the existing framework, the stuff that was over here in my sort of framework, the, the stuff that social researchers have been using for years and years and years, um, just, just wasn't answering the questions, just wasn't giving them the guidance that they needed. Um, um, but clearly, many of the issues raised by, the, by social research are actually addressed by those ethical guidelines. The basic concepts are still there. We still want to protect our respondents. We still want to make sure we're making the most of our data. We still want to um, maintain anonymity, anonymity where we can. We still want to do all those kinds of things. But what's different is that the characteristics of social media in terms of how they mediate the relationship between the researcher and the person who's being researched really create unique challenges um, that have not really been previous co previously covered. So which I quite like, quite like this quote, is that online research presents new ethical problems, and, but specifically it recast old ones in, in new forms and new guises. But those issues are going to really, really vary by project. Um, so whatever, what the subject you're focusing on, so are you doing research into sort of domestic violence, is going to have really, really, really different sort of ethical, con uh, of ethical context And if you're doing something on riots or if you're doing something on online hate or you're doing something on how people travel or tourism or so on and so forth. It's, 
the so the that's going to vary things hugely. But also beyond that, who's your target population? You know, people people online, people on Facebook could be aged 11, 12, 13. Are you trying to research that group of people? It's very very different context if you're trying to re research an adult population. The platform that you're using massively changes the context. Twitter, um, we talk about Twitter a huge amount and too much when we talk about social media research because it is open. It's because it's easy to, relatively easy to access. But actually, if you want to start looking at things like web forums or uh, Facebook is e also still quite hard or all the multitude of other sort of social media platforms that exist, again, it changes the context and it changes the methodologies that you're going to be used to do that. Um, so, for example, you know, observing discussions in an online forum for cancer patients is something that I've seen people use, uh, use social media methods for. And that's really, really sensitive and that's got real particular ethical um, issues. On the other hand, someone using Facebook just as a snowball recruitment method is a completely different research context and has very, very, very different content, uh, very, raises very, very different questions. A further complexity to that is that social media are constantly evolving with new sites or new applications being created, um, but actually even with the, new, with the ones that exist, new features coming up and new terms and conditions as well, so that ta which will change the way you're allowed to use that data. And we sort of earlier touched upon the difference between legality and ethics, but they do sort of intersect and move apart as well. And it's something that sort of falls into this discussion. So, for example, when somebody signed up to Twitter sort of however many years ago, I don't know if there were terms and conditions when they were doing text messaging, but a little bit further along, when you sign, when we agree to those terms and conditions, you're agreeing to a certain set of data, a certain type of data being shared. But since then, you've added capabilities like sharing video, sharing images, now a larger amount of text, links, um, geolocation, etc. When you agree to those terms and conditions, that's not necessarily the same thing that you're using the social media data for now or the social media site for now. And all of this variety in terms of the platforms and all this variety in terms of how things change just make it particularly difficult to prescribe guidance. You know, one size does invariably not fit all for how we should be, how we should be approaching research on social media in an ethical uh, manner. That said, despite sort of the relatively novel and dynamic landscape um, of social media research, headway has been made. And I think as the social research community is becoming more and more and more engaged with social media data as a potential research tool, um, these various issues are being better identified and being un better understood and therefore being better addressed. Uh, there are more and more case studies and more and more examples of how research have been done. And even if those case studies, even if those examples weren't perfect, at least it's a method of saying, you know, in a transparent way, we made these mistakes. If we did this again, this is how we would improve it. And, you know, in that sort of standing on the shoulders of giants kind of way, we're getting better and better about, uh, about thinking about how we should be operating ethically. Um, so just to, just to sort of give a few examples I say you know while it's not quite the wild west it was um, a few years ago there's still a lot of work to be done and as I said the evolving nature uh, may mean that the ethical work on social media research will well I mean it's true for all research but in particular in social media context it, will, it never will be done because what we're thinking about will be constantly be changing so it's therefore important that researchers are aware of the possible issues of conducting research while using social media so you can adapt their methodology in a more reflexive manner um, which maximizes the potential insight um, of that research. I think it's really really important that when we talk about ethics we're not just thinking about it in terms of protection and, and, and minimizing harm and risk but also thinking about how can we maximize the actual research value of this data without within that framework within that context. Um, and what I'll do is just going to run through some of these areas um, just to give give an idea and insight into some of the types of issues that have been raised by researchers as part of our network over the past few years and this is by no means exhaustive uh, not every point will apply to every kind of study but the idea is I'll just give you sort of a flavor of some of the kinds of issues that, that we want to address so one key debate is whether social media platforms count 
as a public space or a private space. And this has some legal implications to start off with. So whether the Data Protection Act applies to the data that you're collecting or not um, and is defined by whether that da those data are public or not. And also as of the ethics of whether it's OK to collect this data passively. And again, it's, it's not consistent in all contexts. Just not all social media data are public and not all social media data are private. Um, you know, different types of sites, some sites are more public an, than others. And actually, even within platforms, within particular social media platforms, you can make different types of arguments for different types of data. So if somebody uh, on Twitter makes their account private, that might make that, that you might interpret that as, as them saying that actually this is private data and it's not publicly available. Is somebody's open page on a Facebook site similar to a, a group? Is a public group different to a private group? And actually, as soon as you, and this, and this is sort of what I mean when it gets quite complicated and you have to be very, very specific about the place of work that you're doing. Um, one way that I like to think about this is um, in terms of the expectation of being observed. So is it likely that a user would expect their posts, expect their content to be viewed outside of the members of that group or their followers or friends or those in their local area or you know who those people who've swiped they've swiped right on on tinder whatever who are they expecting to have their data viewed by but actually that adds even further complexity because when people when a lot of researchers use twitter data when someone said when send some, someone sends out a tweet they actually really expect it to be looked at by their followers the API, um, the open data, actually means that it is still publicly available to everyone. And there's this real disconnect between what users might necessarily expect and what the terms and conditions say and what other people think and what researchers might want them to be thinking when they say that. And uh, just as earlier when I was talking about how people using these data can have quite a wide range of opinions on what is and what is not ethical in this context, actually, um, users and social media users have a really, really varied perspective and really, really varied ideas of what's OK and what's appropriate for their data to be used by. So about two, three years ago, Natsen did some qualitative research with people who use social media data, and we found a huge spectrum and a huge range of different views on, actually I was talking to Mike earlier about um, people thinking about their admin, how people feel about their administrative data being used by government. And on the one hand, some people might be really sensitive and say, no, big brother, that's awful. But others are kind of surprised what the government isn't already linking all of our data together, how inefficient and how terrible. And it's actually the same kind of thing for social media data. Some people, when you ask them, actually you know, feel really private and really defensive and say, no, I own this data. This is my intellectual property and other people shouldn't be using it. But others are saying, yeah, that's fine. I put it out into the public domain. I completely understand this. And I kind of assume that people would be using it already anyway. And that just makes that so that it just makes things so much harder for us as researchers because we can't change our approaches depending on what the people are using individually because we're we're trying to understand at an aggregate level. But being aware of the fact that there are these ranges of opinions is important for the decisions that we make. Um, I think in that context, uh, one of the things to think about is how we approach the observation ethically and how that might impact behaviour. So we've talked a lot about Twitter data and pulling that in automatically, but actually there are circumstances in a smaller qualitative study where a researcher might embed themselves in a, in a forum within a group. And in that context, should a researcher lurk? Should they just stay there, sit there, observe and, and take things in? Or should they be engaging with participants? Do they need to declare themselves as present? Do they need to get consent from the other people who are using that forum? Or perhaps would it be sufficient to get um, consent, and consent from an administrator of that forum? Thinking these things through, and again, vary in varying different contexts, will we'll, we'll change that. Informed consent in social research is sort of one of, sort of the basic tenets, one of the, one of the key important bits of it. Uh, some people suggest that terms and conditions cover informed consent as they will off they will typically state that you know the, the data will be used for research purposes but do people even read those terms and conditions i mean i 
I work in social media research and I've never even bothered like reading the terms and conditions for a good number. Anyone who signed up to the Wi-Fi in this hotel had to click the terms and conditions. Anyone read it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, how can we claim that that's informed consent with any sort of any sorts of reality, any any sort of sense of authenticity? And even if they did read those terms and conditions, when they did that, did they have any sort of idea of how their data were going to be used? You know, when, when Leslie was sort of pulling up all of this Twitter information, he searched on Brexit and, you know, find maybe Jacob Rees-Mogg ex accepted that when he tweeted something out, lots of people were uh, tweeted out about Brexit, lots of people were going to see that. But in that data set, you also would have had Steve from Dundee sort of saying something, slagging off the Tories. And, but he didn't expect that there'd be this room of people in Southampton having a look at that and thinking, oh, that's what Steve from Dundee thinks about that particular issue. And again, that's, in one hand, you know, that's what Steve signed up for. That's what Steve agreed to when he signed the terms and conditions. But he certainly didn't think that I'd be seeing that and be talking about There wasn't a Steve from Dundee, by the way. I'd made him up. Uh, <laughs> I might be, but... Um, so, yeah, it, that's really interesting and, and really problematises this issue. So we need to think about when is informed consent needed? You know, what, what level of consent is adequate and how can we be sure that's informed? You know, is it feasible in when we're trying to scrape in millions and millions and millions of tweets? No, it's really not. But maybe we think about how we do it later down the line. If we want to publish something using their data, if you want to, if you want to do something a little bit more rather than analysing it in abstract. But actually, if you're working in a smaller s sample, when you're working in a forum, when you're work working in a Facebook group, actually, perhaps there is something a little bit more engaged that you can do. Um, the right to be forgotten. Um, if we do take the idea or the principle that posting in a public forum is an acceptable form of consent, then how do we deal with the situations where a user deletes their post? Should that be treated as removal of consent? Um, certainly that's something we'd allow within traditional research, research context. If we ran a survey and then that participant got in contact with us at NatSend and said, actually, please delete all of my data, then we would be obliged to do so. But when you've downloaded hundreds and thousands of, thousands of tweets, there's no sort of mechanism for, for me to know that somebody's necessarily deleted that and change my analysis to reflect that. And actually there are particular requirements and legal requirements for us to do so, but the mechanisms to do that just aren't in place. And to what extent is it, is it the researchers who are responsible for identifying that case, given that participants don't even know that their data have been collected and they're you being used for that particular piece of research? Um, Data security and confidentiality. So how do you protect the data securely and confidentially? So you can apply the usual kinds of protection methods. We were talking about de-identification and anonymization earlier. But social media data is inherently personal. So it is inherently identifiable. You can tw strip out a Twitter username, a Twitter handle, but if anyone with Google and access to the raw data text can search that and go straight back to linking to who that individual is. So even when we sort of de-identify, that can all be traced back. And that's a really sort of odd context for an, an analyst. People we aren't used to, and our typical ethical frameworks aren't used to researchers being able to know who individuals are when they're conducting analysis. And actually, I'll talk about it later. Um, it's not necessarily just researchers doing that. If you're taking a data set and putting it out to coders, for example, people from Mechanical Turk will be sifting the large data sets. What are the data sharing agreements like there when you're trying to get people to look through this data and they know that you're coding stuff on racist tweets or prejudiced tweets and they'll be able to see that that individual has said that. What are the ethics of that? And then finally, at, at the output stages as well is publication. So, for example, Twitter's terms and services tell you that you, when you publish a, quote, a tweet, you have to put their handle, you have to put everything in all in its original context, which is the complete opposite of what we do when we typically quote um, qualitative data and stuff from qualitative interviews. Um, we might paraphrase, we might change random words, but the terms and conditions from Twitter tell you that you can't do that. 
So how do we balance up those two, those two elements, the, the sort of legal and, and the ethical side? Um, data ownership and publication. So to, to further complicate things, oh, well, uh, uh, sorry. So yeah, to, to add to that, does the context of the publication matter? So does it matter whether it's a journal paper, an internal report, a blog post? What, be, what might be a user's expectation um, to the level of viewing of what they're putting out? So if we're happy that nobody actually is going to see this out of a small academic community, is that OK? Actually, if we're putting a, a big post online, we're writing a journalistic piece where thousands of people might see that Steve from Dundee um, didn't really care for Brexit, then actually a completely different context. There's a fundamental question about who owns the data. Can a researcher have ownership of data which is produced for those non-research purposes? If the data are being treated as published text, which is what is arguably allowing us to collect it in this manner in the first place, can it re be republished without attribution to that original author? Can it be anonymised? Can it be altered? Do we need permission from them to publish it, yet alone um, to change it, edit it? Um, actually, how would some of the social media platforms themselves consider the intellectual property of that content? Twitter might have one particular set of terms and conditions, but other platforms might have different ideas about who owns that data. I mean, just to go back a stage, I mean, we were talking about um, Pulsar and other sort of other other companies that sell the data. The concept of ownership there sort of compli complicates things because it's not the respondents, it's not the people we're researching who we're paying to access the data. It's Twitter and it's the social media platforms themselves that might get access to that, get that money if we're collecting more than that random 1%. So again, this sort of complicates things and, and bringing in a transactional element to it um, makes it even more complex. Um, also quickly talk about the blurring of boundaries. So what may be particularly novel for many researchers is that that the space you're researching within or of may be one in which you yourself operate. So your own tweets, your own comments might be picked up if you are part of the network that you are researching. So if I take a random set of tweets, as every chance, I'm not that prolific, but you know, every chance I'll be part of that data set. What does that mean for objectivity, for, for data quality and how I interpret the data? But that's probably relatively unlikely, but also it might be someone that you know who is picked up in the data set. Again, those have the same issues in terms of objectivity and data quality, but and actually it might be okay on something like Facebook or Twitter because you may, if you know them, you may well be following them and interacting with them already. But what if you're doing some research on a platform like Grindr or Tinder? That's completely different context, but completely plausible. And people's ser personal sensitive information might be picked up from you. And that's quite ethically challenging. And there's very little you can do to stop that happening. Also, if you're interacting online yourself, that means that you yourself are searchable. So how, thinking about how you present yourself online. If you are in a forum, if you are operating in a Facebook group, do you create an alternative research persona? Or do you use your own personal account? And what does that mean about the power relationships between you and the people you're researching, how they view you? And if you've got your actual name there, then it doesn't matter because they can go and Google you anyway and find out a lot more information about you. And that completely, again, changes the dynamics and the relationships of, of how you're researching. So there's a real blurring of the professional and the personal identities that are taking part in this research. Um, this talks more, I think, to the sort of quality elements of things. Um, but I think that is still an important part of ethical discussions. So does everybody have a fair and equal chance to have their voice heard? So we're excluding people without web access and without a social media account. But also we're more likely to pick up people who are really, really vocal. So when you take that random 1%, it's not a random 1% of people, it's a random 1% of tweets. So somebody who tweets 100 times is 100 more times more likely than somebody who only to be picked up than someone who only tweets once. And what does that mean about bias in our sample? But also, what does that mean ethically? Are we over-representing the views of some types of people relative to the views of other people? 
There's also issues around verification. So we've talked a little bit about bots. Um, do we know that it's a person? Do we know it's an organisation? Do we know that it's a bot tweeting? And how can we, how can we differentiate those and how we should analyse those differently? How do we know that the people researching are part of our target population, that they are in the UK, that they are in Iran, Iraq, wherever, that we, these are the people we want to re be researching? And also there's something here about online and offline identity. Does an online identity or an avatar count as a human subject where there's an ethical onus? So when somebody is in sort of a massive multiplayer online role-playing game, am I researching the character or am I researching the individual behind the character? And, and what does that mean for ethics and typical ethical sort of ideas of the, of the person? And who do, you get who do you get consent off of? Are you getting consent from the character or the person behind that? You're also going to be picking up information about people's broader networks. So if I pick in a load of Twitter data, I don't just get the information about that individual, but I get information about who retweets them or who they're retweeting or who they're replying to. And that spreads out um, the information beyond the actual research subjects that you're looking at. So one of the programs I'm working on is look about linking survey and social media data. And I've got consent from the people in the surveys to link those two together, but I haven't got consent from anyone else who they're connected to. But I'm still going to pick up information about those. So it's only partially addressing these problems. And different types of data will have different issues. You know, numbers of retweets, number of followers, thing, very basic metrics, probably OK. Um, but more detailed text data is going to bring up certain challenges. But then images, videos, are actually mu even more challenging. Firstly, because it's very difficult to automatically identify and say these are problematic, these are not problematic. If you have things like images of children and family members, what are the ethics uh, uh, of that? Um, I'll also mention derived variables, um, raw data, public information, fine, but as soon as you manipulate that at all, as soon as you try to extract something that summarises what's said in that content, um, that changes it and it's no longer public data because you've assumed some knowledge about a person. You might have, so for example, Facebook, there's lots of research using Facebook and it takes the pages you like, the people you follow, the type of text you say, and it will make summary judgments about you. It will make summary judgments about you, whether you voted Republican or Democrat, but it will also make summary judgments about your sexuality, about your all kinds of sens potentially sensitive elements of your life that, that those people didn't make available and didn't say that it was OK for you to assume that about me. And if those algorithms that are deriving those characteristics are any good, um, which is you know, not necessarily there. Either they're rubbish and you shouldn't be using them, or they're good and actually that's sensitive information that you've just extracted and, ma and, and made available about an individual. Um, yeah, so there's some other things as well. Responsibility for reporting abuse. So if you do find sensitive uh, content online, what ethically is the role of the researcher to then report that or intervene in that situation? Um, how do these interact with traditional methods, legal issues, terms of service, I've sort of touched on a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's a really quick whistle-stop tour in about sort of 20, 30 minutes um, of some of the issues. There's a load of resources here that are really, really good. Um, <laughs> industry guidelines are all right. Um, the University of Aberdeen framework, I think, was set up was done about six months a year ago and there's a good sort of flow chart and idea of what to look at. The Lancaster University Ethics Forum was set up like a couple of weeks ago and it's meant to be a forum for discussing ethical issues around social media data. Very, very much recommend um, looking at that. Nat Sims report on social media views is really good. The Wisdom of the Crowd report as well has some interesting discussion around ethics. Um, there's this book um, coming up which will be published relatively soon which actively engages with discussions around ethics and online research and the handbook of social media research as well has a reasonable amount of information. I can send links to like loads of these if you want to get them off me at the end of it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much.